Mary Poppins may be practically perfect in every way, but Mary Poppins Returns has made some interesting changes that actually contradict some of the details and events from the original movie. yippee ki movie lovers, I'm Jan, and today I'm revealing six ways that Mary Poppins Returns ignored what happened in the first film, and I'll also explain why. Some mild spoilers ahead, though I avoid any significant plot reveals. A snow globe of St. Paul's Cathedral played a memorable part in the original movie when Mary Poppins sang the lullaby Feed the Birds to young Michael and Jane. And that snow globe pops up again in the sequel, along with the wooden letter blocks and kite, when the now adult Michael is searching through the attic for something he's lost. The snow globe in this scene is used as a nostalgic way to remind us and Michael of his time with Mary Poppins. And when he comments that he doesn't know why they've kept any of this stuff, it shows us he's lost his childlike wonder. The problem with this little easter egg though is that it's almost impossible for Michael to still have that snow globe because in the original movie, Mary Poppins took it with her when she left the Banks family. Yes, the magical nanny actually put the snow globe into her carpet bag together with all her other belongings just before her departure. And unless she's been making secret visits to Michael's attic to hide snow globes there during the 20 odd years since she was last in Cherry Tree Lane, then it shouldn't have appeared there in the sequel. When a Robin accompanied Mary as she sang a spoonful of sugar to the Banks children in the original movie, it was a delightful little moment. But as sweet as that scene is, it's also guilty of a goof, because despite the movie's London setting, the Robin that perches itself on Mary's fingers is an American Robin, which is much larger than the European Robin found in England. The sequel actually fixes the original error via the decorative Robin on Mary's hat, which this time around is a European Robin, with a much smaller red breast than its American cousin. So the new Robin isn't just a fun easter egg to a spoonful of sugar, but also a neat little way of correcting that movie mistake from the first film. Now we've got to talk about how Emily Blunt has introduced a Mary Poppins with a quite distinct character to Julie Andrews' version in the original movie. I think it's great that Blunt decided to create her own Mary rather than try and imitate what Julie Andrews did, because as Blunt herself has said, no one is ever going to out Julie Julie Andrews. I mentioned previously in my comparison video how Emily Blunt looked to author P.L. Travers' Mary Poppins books for inspiration, and in those books the magical nanny is much more abrasive and ruder than the generally more kind but firm character so many of us grew to love in Julie Andrews. And that's why when Mary Poppins comes back in the sequel, she's got a slightly weirder edge to her, and you could say she comes across as a bit sharper. We even see a somewhat more risque side to Mary during her performance of the song A Cover Is Not The Book, where she drops her new very posh pronunciation for a Cockney accent, and sings lyrics laden with adult humour. The very prim and proper nanny we met in the original movie is nowhere to be found during this vaudevillian song and dance number. In other words, this is not your childhood Mary Poppins. When Mary Poppins returns in the new movie, so does her talking umbrella, but this time around the parrot umbrella is quite different. First of all, its colour has changed from green to a deep, almost reddish brown colour. And secondly, it's also a lot more chatty. In the original Mary Poppins film, the umbrella was silent throughout and only spoke at the end to complain that the Banks children weren't grateful enough and to slightly scold Mary for not admitting how much she really cared about the family. Practically perfect people never permit sentiment to muddle their thinking. Is that so? Well, I'll tell you one thing, Mary Poppins. You don't fool me a bit. Oh, really? Yes, really. I know exactly how you feel about these children, and if you think I'm going to keep my mouth shut any longer, I... That will be quite enough of that, thank you. I imagine many people were pleasantly surprised when the parrot suddenly spoke for the first time at the end of the 1964 film, and I think the creative team behind Mary Poppins Returns realised the comic potential of giving the parrot umbrella a bigger talking part this time around. So in the new movie, the umbrella gets a number of nice moments, including some choice comedic lines and a funny little interaction with Dick Van Dyke, which is part of the plot. However, the parrots reply that grown-ups forget they always do when Georgie asks why his father doesn't believe that Mary Poppins arrived on a kite makes me think the new film has also given the parrots some aspects of the talkative jackdaw in P.L. Travers' Mary Poppins books. In the first book, for example, the jackdaw tells two of the Banks children that as kids grow up, they forget all about the magical things that happened. As for the parrot's new look, the movie's production designer has said about the film that we want people to feel like they're seeing something they've seen before, but they're really seeing it for the first time. Fun fact, in the 1964 movie, the parrot umbrella was voiced by David Tomlinson, who also played the children's father, while in Mary Poppins Returns, the voice is provided by Edward Hibbert, who's best known as a snooty restaurant critic Gil from the TV sitcom Frasier. 
Next, it's time to show how the sequel's new timeline has messed with Mary Poppins' age, possibly confirming a popular fan theory that Mary Poppins may well, in fact, be a Time Lord. For anyone who doesn't know, the first Mary Poppins movie was set in 1910, and Julie Andrews was 28 at the time of the US release. However, Mary Poppins Returns is set in the 1930s, in Depression-era London, so the events take place around 20 to 30 years after the first film. Emily Blunt, though, is only 35, just seven years older than Julie Andrews was at the time. Of course, actors don't just play their own real age, but generally have a certain range within which they're able to play convincingly. However, whichever way you look at it, Emily Blunt doesn't look anything like 48 to 58 years old, which is what Mary Poppins would be based on Andrews' age at the time, and if Mary Poppins had aged 20 to 30 years, like the time gap between the two stories. All in all, it seems that Mary Poppins has barely aged, even though the Banks children have completely grown up, as has Jack, who knew Mary when he was a child. The sequel knows this and, to be fair, owns the inconsistency making a joke of it. Good heavens! It really is you. You seem hardly to have aged at all. Really? How incredibly rude. One never discusses a woman's age, Michael. Would have hoped I taught you better. As for the official explanation, the movie's producer Mark Platter said that Mary's a character who lives outside of time. She's magic, and so she is the one character who actually doesn't age. Admiral Boom and his first mate, Mr. Binnacle, both return for what is actually a slightly bigger part in the sequel. Although the pair still fire their cannon to mark the time, in Mary Poppins Returns there's a running joke about how they're no longer reliable, which is very different to the reputation Boom had built up about his timekeeping in the original movie. What he's famous for is punctuality. The old world takes its time from Greenwich. But Greenwich, they say, takes its time from Emerald Boom. When the sequel begins, we discover that Boom and Binnacle's cannon fire now runs consistently late when measured against Big Ben, although Boom actually believes it's Big Ben that's wrong. While this is certainly a change from the 1964 film, if you've seen the new movie, you'll know that Boom's time difference with Big Ben is part of the plot, though I won't spoil the details. And in a little further explanation of this change, the movie's novelization also adds that the Admiral had slowed down in his later years and his sense of time had slowed with him. Well, it's fun to spot these little differences, but you should know that Mary Poppins never explains anything, so we can probably put these changes down to Mary's magic. Now, what do you think were the best and worst parts of the sequel? Let me know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this, smash that subscribe button and notification bell so you don't miss any new videos. Next, tap left to find out all the amazing details you missed in Mary Poppins Returns, or tap right for another Mary Poppins video you're sure to like. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Yippee-ki-yay, movie lovers!